Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, the legislative session ends in a flurry of activity and fiery debate. Then I am disgusted by the way she was treated a few moments ago. The bullying, the attacks, Plus, the promise of a special session looms as the state moves closer to legalizing cannabis. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. It's called the regular session, but this one was anything but a normal occurrence for lawmakers. We'll run down key legislation and take a closer look at the leftward swing of the legislature. And we'll check out the fate of good government legislation. We'll also ask the line to look at the experience of women in the legislature as a late night blow up for senators to recess and take a deep breath. We're going to look at where New Mexico's cannabis legislation fits into the national picture. And we sit down with the two men at the top of Albuquerque's police department to talk about the job in front of them. We begin with the line. The progressive era has arrived at the New Mexico legislature. Many of us wondered what the impact of a leftward swing in the Senate would be this session. And it's fair to say we've gotten a good look at it. Here to opine on that session and that just ended last weekend is our all journalist line panel. Joining us from the southeastern part of the state, news director for the Carlsbad Current Argus, Alamogordo News and Ruidoso News, Jessica Onsures joins us once more. From the New Mexico Political Report and our own Growing Forward Cannabis podcast, Andy Lyman is back. Editorial page editor for the Santa Fe New Mexican, Inez Russell Gomez is here. And Capitol Bureau Chief for the Albuquerque Journal, Dan Boyd, takes another turn at our virtual roundtable. All right, we'll get to these topics with everyone, but Dan, I'm just going to list some legislation that passed. Mandatory sick leave for private businesses, uh, aid in dying, repealing an abortion criminalization measure, Dipping into the permanent fund for early childhood, childhood education, a trapping ban. Is this a progressive wish list as uh, was predicted? I, I think it really showed that uh, elections have consequences. Um, you know, some of those bills you just mentioned had stalled in the Senate repeatedly in recent years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that they were able to get them through this year. Uh, certainly, I don't think the progressives got everything they wanted. There's still some issues hanging out there on the, uh, the calendar. But, you know, the, the permanent fund debate, that's been a, a decade, you know, that hadn't been able to kind of get that over the finish line and and to see that happen this year i mean was you re really showed i think that the differences in the senate and the fact that new people in leadership uh, new mm -hmm. committee chairs and and that those do have consequences and, and i think we're we're starting to see that and there's some frustration among republicans i think that they couldn't uh, maybe have the influence of years past in, in stopping some of those bills but certainly i think that the progressive faction at the roundhouse is uh, emboldened and, and kind of flex their muscle a little bit this year. Mm -hmm. Hey, Jessica, you know, early childhood education, there's money that comes from extractive industries, which, of course, you know, in your part of the state, how do people feel about a 25 percent bump in what the state takes from the permanent fund? What's your sense of that? I think there was a lot of concern about what that means for that fund, um, especially since we're in such uncertain revenue um, times. Um, we had a lot of um, in the in the communities here, I think we had a lot of debate about um, what that looks like when you execute that money inside the the school systems. Um, that was where the concern lied. Not so much as pulling that money because everybody can get behind supporting um, education. I think, but really, what does execution of those funds look like within our public schools? Mm -hmm. Andy, this is interesting to me. Legislation like a trapping ban I mentioned, um, environmental regulation, aid in dying legalization. Republicans weren't keen on them all. Certainly. Um, we often heard elections have consequences in the Trump era, and of course, Dan just mentioned that as well. Is this the same deal just on the other end of the political spectrum? Is that what's going on here? Um, it could be. You know, one thing, as Dan was talking about it, it occurred to me that uh, this is sort of the, the last session before uh, the governor's up for, for re-election, right? There's a big election in 2022. Right. Um, next year is a 30-day session. They don't get to like take, take as big a, a bite as they usually would. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it was sort of, you know, uh, pedal to the metal this session to try to get all those things done. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm so, I'm so curious, Inez, how you feel like where the governor is on this. You know, we've talked about, you know, this legislative tilt, of course, we just did. But the governor is going to sign or veto all these things. What have we learned about her politics, you know, with the measures that she's favored, uh, you know, this session? 
Well, I think that she was pretty clear what her priorities were. Mm -hmm. Um, And she had been for aid and dying. She had promised that she would repeal the criminalization of abortion. And I think one of her frustrations as a Democratic governor with Democratic majorities is that she was unable to deliver. Mm -hmm. And and I think one of the themes in politics from Congress all the way down to the state house and to local governments is that if you run for something and you make promises, you want to be able to deliver. And we've had a situation in many areas of government where minorities um, in terms of political parties can stop what majorities want, whether it's a political majority or the majority of the people. So I think for her to go back on the campaign trail, she's going to say, look, I kept my promises. Right. Now, whether that works for her, we'll see, because especially with Aiden dying in the abortion uh, laws, there are a lot of Democratic Catholic voters who don't like it. And we have seen in Santa Fe, and probably in northern New Mexico and other parts of the states, priests actually preaching from the pulpit against it. Mm-hmm. So whether that affects voters and changes who votes for whomever, we'll see. Mm-hmm. Interesting point there. Andy, I want to, I'm sorry, my fault. Dan, I want to come back to the same issue of um, that abortion ban. It, it passed early. You know, the, it really didn't seem like it was a, 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 lot, of, a lot of, you know, angst about it. It just sort of sailed right through. What was just as you watched it happen? Did, was it a clue to anything to come, as they say? For us, it was really a, a specifically in the Senate kind of a, a test case of, of yeah. whether, you know, especially since that bill had failed two years ago, mm-hmm. some mo- eight moderate Democrats had voted uh, against it, and, and a lot of them were ousted in last year's primary election. So it was kind of a a test case. And once it it passed the Senate, I, I think that really showed us you know, that things had changed, that it was kind of a new era. Um, not that any uh, progressive bill would get through, but um, but on, with only two Democrats against, voting against it this year and, and the governor, she had she had been clear, like uh, Inez said, you know, that get me this bill. And, and as soon as we have the votes in the Senate, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. And clearly that was the case this year. And, and like you said, I mean, they got that one through, I think, about halfway through the session, which is pretty early for a right. <laughs> It's amazing to think about that, isn't it? Halfway through, you know, the big first one gets signed. Andy, let's talk about the budget part of this job. One for lawmakers, of course, uh, depends in on the availability of it, it sort of hung up on the availability of pandemic relief funds. Is this a novel approach for legislators to include this kind of, you know, contingency? Is it safe? You know, or is it just a one time thing? I would have to, to guess that it's a one time thing. I mean, it's hard to say if anything, everything is is novel in the past, you know, uh, 12 to 13 months at this point. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, I would think that they would probably sort of shift away from that uh, in the coming years, I would guess. Yeah. Uh, Inez, payday loans did not make it through. And again, another issue that's been out there for years. What happened there? Um Somehow along the way, instead of keeping it at 36%, which was still a good profit for the lenders, uh, they added in the house, which was interesting, a 99% um, cap and the Senate wouldn't concur, so it died. So you could argue they should have kept the compromise and moved on. But I, I think this is one of those bills where they said we've compromised enough because remember, it used to be 150 something and they got it you know, they got it down from, from, and now it, it's, it's still going to be 150 something and we're just going to have to come back. I think this is one of those uh, bills where people who get contributions from payday lenders say we're helping poor people mm-hmm. and feel good about themselves, even though it's one of those cycle of poverty things that, that we need to, to get out of. I mean, if the military says 36% is good enough for their soldiers and their sailors, et cetera, I think probably we can live with that. Mm -hmm. Jessica, can I ask you to pick up on that as well uh, for your part of the state? What's your, you know, they're they're everywhere. I'm not, you know, saying they're just in your part of the state, but that that sense of of not having this passed, is it the impact in, in your part of the world? Well, just to pick up on what Inez is saying, we're talking about a, a cycle of poverty where, where it's a bill that um, when you look at it on its face, it's it's one of those helping bills. The thought is that we are able to um, engage with that. 
below the poverty line communities. And there's a lot of those rural communities um, in this region. Um, I know that there was a lot of disappointment that it, that it didn't. There was a lot of debate among our um, small businesses um, about what their employees could access at the moment and how that would impact them overall. But I think that um, just like Ines said, there was a lot of frustration that maybe um, there could have been more compromise to get this thing um, to move forward a bit more. Yeah. Jess, I got another one for you, and I'd like some others to kick in on this one, too. Um, did we get meaningful police reform or did lawmakers, you know, let the Black, Black Lives Matter moment pass here? Was something missed? I do think something was missed. I think this, if there was going to be a moment for any type of police reform, now would have been it in the wake of everything that we've seen um, with the Black Lives um, Matters movement. Um, I know that our, the consensus from this region is that we want to do everything we can to ensure that our local um, state and um, regional law enforcement um, are, are protected, that they're able to do their job and do their job well and serve the public good. Um, but I think there, there was also a lot of voices in communities across New Mexico um, with concerns about how they do their jobs and, and making sure that they're protected as well as police officers execute their um, duties. Um, so we we didn't get very far, I don't, in my opinion, of course, we didn't get very far with um, law enforcement reform. Mm-hmm. Dan Boyd, what was the hang up for, for police reform? What, what were the you sticky know, I points? Think- I, I think one dynamic uh, clearly was the, the death of a state police officer in the line of duty during the, the middle of the session down in the Deming area. And I think that, you know, really brought a, a human element to the debate. The, some legislators knew him or knew his family personally. Um, I, I do think they passed the Civil Rights Act, which mm-hmm. if the governor signed that, you know, would allow for for lawsuits to be filed in state district court. You know, that was a pretty hotly debated bill. And I don't know that I would call that law enforcement reform. Um but it was me- one measure that did get some traction. But I, I agree. I think the other ones, you know, I, I think there was some pushback that law, law enforcement felt they weren't at the table or they're being kind of targeted. And, and you know, maybe this was the, the year to do it. But I, I think to get something like that passed, there's going to have to be some, some buy-in and, and maybe, um, you know, compromises made on, on all sides. And it doesn't seem like we're there quite yet. Yeah. I know the same, same question. It, you know, there's been... Obviously, Santa Fe has had its ups and downs with protests in the street, not necessarily Black Lives Matter related, certainly. But, you know, something seems to have clunked here when it seemed like it had a lot of momentum going in. I think that um, what we've seen when you look at early childhood, that sometimes big things take several years. So that, that it feels like this is the moment to act, you know, to get rid of rubber bullets or or things that, you know, can hurt protesters. Um but you have to hear out the police side, which is this is how they can protect themselves without actually, you know, shooting real bullets into crowds. Um, so I, I kind of think this will be back because as as we see, you know, every year there's going to be another outrage, whether it's a police officer killing somebody or as what happened just recently in Boulder, a brave policeman being killed, saving other people's lives. And this is complicated. Yep. Glad you mentioned him, a Highland High School grad. Uh, as well. And he has family here in Albuquerque as well, the slain officer. Uh, Andy, lawmakers came this close, maybe this close, to legalizing uh, recreational adult use marijuana. Uh, In fact, we'll see a special session and potentially the next few days or so. Um, In in a little bit, we're going to hear from Politico's cannabis reporter in a second, but recap what happened and where things stand right now, if you would. Yeah, so a lot of the action happened last week, actually, the last few days. Um, the, everyone, all eyes were on one, one uh, Senate committee. Uh, legalization got through that committee, but it was sort of, you know, three, two and a half days left. Uh, the chair of that committee said, this bill's just not ready. I think uh, one of the committee members said it's not ready for prime time. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so the last about 48 to 24 hours was this big question of when are they going to get it to the floor? Uh, things started to come through and, and eventually it was confirmed on Friday night uh, about, you know, 12 hours or so before um, the, the session was supposed to be over that, uh, the governor was going to call a, a special session. So, um, essentially to, to, to simplify it, all of that stuff is scrapped. We're going to start from, from fresh or the legislature is going to start fresh with probably some, some bits and pieces, but, um, we have yet to see what, what they're going to consider yet. Yeah. Dan, Dan, on that last point, Andy just made about not sure what we're going to consider. Do we have a situation where other things may get snuck in? to this special? I mean, it's almost irresistible when you think about it. 
That that's some certainly we're we're on the lookout for. The governor didn't rule it out. I mean, I don't I don't think she wants to add a lot of things to the agenda. Um, but once you get legislators there, certainly there's going to be a lot of groups pushing for their bills to to be included that didn't make it over the finish line. And uh, you know, like Andy mentioned, the cannabis legalization is is very complicated. The more you look into issues, the more questions it raises. And for whatever ra- reasons, I don't think they um, had some of those conversations early enough in the session. And uh, I don't think, you know, trying to pass it in a single day special session is going to be a challenge uh, unless they can reach some kind of a, agree, a deal or an agreement ahead of time. That's our New Mexico way. All right. We've been keeping up with the recreational cannabis push through our Growing Forward podcast, which Andy co-hosts with Megan Kemrick, my colleague. We recently brought in Natalie Fertig of Politico to get a feel for how New Mexico's approach to legalization squares with what's happening nationally. Here's a bit of that interview. We are joined today by Natalie Fertig, a journalist with Politico who covers cannabis on a national level. Thanks so much for joining us today, Natalie. Yeah, thanks for having me, you guys. Natalie, part of the criticism here of this year's front runner bill and its predecessors in the past years was the length and how many issues it tried to cover. So compared to the states you've covered, how fair is that characterization of New Mexico's attempt this year? Did it try to do too much? I mean, what we have to recognize about New Mexico's attempt is that New Mexico is still in the first round of states that are actually doing this through legislative action. I know that it's the 17th state, if will be the 17th state to legalize adult use cannabis if this bill passes, but the majority of those states have done so through ballot measures. And so legislatures have been going back in after regulations were passed and either trying to change things from the ballot measures that maybe didn't work. Um, Colorado, for example, famously allowed medical patients to grow 100 plants at home for the first couple of years that the legislature then had to go in and drastically reduce that home grow limit, which was essentially a small farm. Um, but other states that have done this through ballot measures, some of those ballot measures were very detailed and some of them were not. I think the closest to New Mexico would be either Virginia's legislation or Illinois' legislation, which both regulated cannabis and also addressed social equity, creating social equity funds and doing expungements. But some of the other states have not maybe um, done it that in that complicated of a fashion. You've touched on the whole issue of plant counts, plant limits for growers. So what is the trend you're seeing across the country in terms of production control? I mean, honestly, New Mexico, you guys are are so interesting and an outlier in this whole thing nationally. I had to ask, um, I, I spoke with Representative Martinez about his bill at the beginning of the session, and I totally messed up. I had no clue what he was talking about with plant counts. I thought he was talking about home grow, and he had to correct me because it's not something I've actually ever heard before, um, putting a cap on the number of plants that can be grown. Usually states discuss caps on licenses, limiting the number of licenses that are out there, the number of people who can grow. And then they have separate licenses for different amounts of plants. So in California, you can have a tiny license for less than 5,000 plants. You can have a 5,000 to 10,000 plant license. But essentially in California, even you could stack 5,000 plant licenses to the ends of the earth if you had the space to do it. So the cap on plants is, is, that's a New Mexico only thing. And as someone who covers a lot of these states, I'm very excited to see how this plays out. You just touched on this, but how did other states that have legalized try to address some of those social justice or equity issues that the New Mexico legislation had? Well, it's been a bumpy ride. Um, California was one of the first states, along with Massachusetts and Illinois, to create social equity programs. Um, Illinois was the first state to just blanket expunge nonviolent, low level cannabis related um, uh, records, <laughs> looking for that word. Um, but even some of these programs that were early, Massachusetts program, for example, has hit a lot of hurdles. Because one of the things that um, a lot of lawmakers did not recognize was that you can give equity applicants a head start, but you also need to give equity applicants the means to then succeed with that license or with that priority status. Um, I mean, I've seen in reporting on California, a lot of the people getting licenses are people coming from the real estate industry. You know, they have been dealing with 
licensing and um, city permitting and they have deep pockets and they have deep pocketed friends. And then you see someone coming from one of the communities and the zip codes that have been most impacted by the war on drugs and they don't have deep pocketed friends. They don't have deep pockets themselves. They don't know how to talk to city council people. They don't know how to file all the complicated paperwork. And so even though they have priority status in the system, they're still not getting open. Their doors aren't getting open. And a lot of the people with the power, a lot of the white men who, you know, have the institutional knowledge, um, which, you know, not placing blame or anything, but that's the system and that's the reality, um, are progressing further than the, the equity applicants. It's a very, very complicated problem to solve. At the start of the legislative session, more than a few news stories mentioned the majority of representatives would be women for the first time in New Mexico's history. And Senator Mimi Stewart beat out challengers to assume the mantle of President Pro Tem, a powerful position that influences committee appointments. But it was Senator Stewart, who was no shrinking violet, certainly, who called a Thursday night exchange with fellow Democrat Daniel Ivey Soto an abusive line of inquiry as she presented her mandatory sick leave bill. We have the debate linked online at NewMexicoInFocus.org. I encourage you to see this if you have not seen it, that exchange. A number of male senators call it, called it disgraceful or embarrassing for Mr. Ivy Soto, and Liz Stefanix called it bullying. In fact, the Senate recessed for half an hour to cool off. It was clear from the get-go that this was going to be contentious, but did Senator Ivy Soto cross the line? Inez, I'll start with you. Well, I actually was watching it uh, as it happened because I, I couldn't sleep and I was curious what was going on in judiciary. And I remember watching it thinking, oh my gosh, he's not stopping. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that he was abusive in the sense that he was calling her names or being rude that way. It's just that he kept asking the same question over and over and he had the answer and he didn't move on. Right. And it was, I, I said in a tweet at the time, there's questioning to elicit information and there's questioning to badger. Mm -hmm. This is badgering. Mm -hmm. Will someone stop it? And what I wondered is, you know, where was Howie Morales, who was running the Senate session? Um, he did say we need to be civil, but nothing like saying, let's move on. And when Liz Stefanik stood up behind Mimi Stewart and said, this is bullying, it was just one of those moments that you thought, wow, I'm not alone in seeing that this is a little too much. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very uncomfortable. And I cannot imagine what it was like to be in the room. And Senator Stewart was so firm, never wavered and never got angry. And I don't know how she kept her cool. I was really impressed. Mm -hmm. Jessica, you know, when you think about it, you know, she was being treated as a hostile witness when you when you kind of, you know, break it down in the, the idea that, you know, she's the most powerful woman in the Senate. Some, you know what I mean? Something was just out of balance here. Well, how did you view this? Well, like, and as I was watching it as it was happening, and I think that the first thing that came to me was the sense of, of decorum, right? We um, we conduct these these sessions as as bodies, um, representatives of our of our own communities, and the thought is that they will um, do so in a um, respectful manner. So that's the first thought that came to my mind as well as I was watching this. And I kudos to um, uh, Mimi Store as well. Like as I said, she did keep her cool, um, and she was um, standing her ground as she did it. So that was impressive to see. But I think that one of the um, the big takeaways from from that exchange was just, you know, it's it's more than just about passion. And I think that um, Senator Soto came back and said, hey, I'm, this is a, something I'm passionate about. Um, and that's why I got heated and and continue to with my line of questioning. Um, how, how, did that answer, how did that response work for you? Senator Ivy, you know, response. So the, the follow up to all of this is really this idea of how women um, are disproportionately treated um, in bodies like this. And as a woman, I think any any woman, professional woman in any private or public sector wants to under wants to know that they are going to receive the same level of respect and treatment as their male colleagues. And we want to see that from our public bodies as well. Um, I looked at it as I, as bullying, definitely um, not necessarily on the status of her sex, but most definitely on the status of the power that she holds within that body. Andy, Jessica mentioned just a second ago about standing her ground. And that was not without irony, because I seem to recall, and we all did as we were watching, uh, Mr. Ivy Soda demanding that Ms. Stewart stand 
you know, during this whole thing was like, whoa, hang on now. <laughs> Something seems to have taken a turn here. And, you know, it, again, this idea of badgering. Now, we understand that standing while you're giving testimony in the Senate floor is the way it's done. But demanding someone stand, I can't recall that ever happening in, in my time. It's not forever, but I can't recall. Can you recall any time you've ever seen something like that? No, uh, I mean, I, not, not in that same way. I yeah. did see a few times uh, this session where uh, you see somebody speaking and you could tell somebody off camera said, hey, you know, reminded them to stand up. I think um, it, it seemed to, there was a more common this time because I think people were so used to uh, zooming in for committee meetings and, and that sort of thing. So I think <clears throat> there was a lot of people that just sort of slipped their mind that, oh, I'm on the, the Senate floor. I mm -hmm. have to stand up when I speak. But no, to answer your question more directly, I don't remember a specific time um, where the person sort of asking the questions says, hey, you got to stand up to do this. Yeah. Dan Boyd, have you ever witnessed anything like that in your time? It was, I, and I was actually in the Senate chamber um, when it all happened, and I can certainly tell you, you could feel the, the tension in the room, um, even at one o'clock in the morning or, or whenever it was, it was, it was late. It was late, yeah. Um, you know, you, my take is, I think there'd been these tensions building during the session. Um, some male senators ha have kind of a very hard-hitting way of questioning even other legislators and um, kind of almost uh, prosecutorial sometimes. And I think that had been building some tension and, and it spilled over, it boiled over that night. Um, I, I don't think it's something that's gonna just blow, you know, blow away. I think we're gonna be seeing more about this. And I think it is kind of, this has maybe been the culture of the Senate and now with more women and uh, a more diverse chamber, I, I think there's gonna be kind of a, a, a bit of a reckoning and, and I'm not sure exactly how that's all gonna play out, but I, I think certainly with more women now in the legislature, you know, that some of these old ways of doing things are, are, are being challenged. Mm -hmm. Dan, staying with you for a second, is there any downside for Misty Ivy Soto politically? I mean, let's, I, Mimi Stewart's very powerful. She, like I mentioned, and you know, she doles out committee seat assignments. Uh, any, any risk here for Mr. Ivy Soto? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly think there is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'll see how it all blows out. I, I think, you know, I had heard some suggestions about possible censure or acts like that. Um, he's also the chairman of the Senate Rules Committee. And Mimi Stewart is the pro tem who decides committee assignments. So um, that's kind of to be continued what, what happens there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think he insisted that that it wasn't a um, sexist or, a, you know, but just that that he's passionate about issues. And but I think the way he came across and the response we saw from other senators, you know, mm -hmm. kind of suggested and especially other female s senators suggested that they kind of shared her her response or her view of how that how that all went down. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Jessica, interestingly, when I, when I think about this as well in my mind's eye, I think about that exchange. One of the things that was really interesting to me is that uh, it, 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 she, she, would not, she didn't want to yield to his questioning. She refused, to just, she wanted to bag out of it. And it seems like we don't have a system up there where if, if a, if a uh, politician is feeling attacked, where it just bring it to a halt personally. And to go back to Inez's point, the presiding officer, so to speak, has to step in there. He said a couple of times, oh, man, just cool it down. What could he have done to stop this? Could he really, really gotten after Mr. Ivy Soto in a much more vigorous way? I think to go back to what um, Dan said, which is we are talking about bodies that are really based in tradition, right? Um, yes, it is his job to maintain order in those in, in that chamber, particularly. Um, but it, hindsight is twenty twenty. Um, as as Dan said again, there was a lot of tension in the room. Everybody was feeling it. Um, perhaps he wasn't thinking at the moment that this is something I need to intercede in. Rather, he was thinking this is the way that our democracy works: debate um, and. As a you know, as a member of uh, the public body, it's her job to receive these questions and answer them as best she can. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we do come now with with that hindsight that we do come back with some thoughts on how um, to reform some of these items. Um, you know, what do these procedures look like? What do you right. do if you're if you are as a as a legislator feeling bullied or attacked or um, even if these de debates just don't go anywhere, right? We were talking about how he's asking the same question over and over, refusing to acknowledge the answer. Um, and that doesn't that doesn't further the discussion at all. So I definitely think there was more he could have done in the moment, but um, I think that's the that's the nature of hot heads um, and that's the nature of um, debate in the moment.
There you go. And as real quick, uh, you know, just a reminder, it was two regular sessions ago. We had really the original Me Too moment up in, in the legislature, but it involved lobbyists. And I'm, I'm wondering if that is in the, in the background of all this, that this has been on slow boil to medium boil, now high boil for a lot of women, starting with that lobbying situation two years ago, and it just sort of exploded here. Is, is there, do you agree with that, that that's mixed in here as well? I do think so. And yeah. I, I think that um, the influx of younger women who maybe haven't put up with if sexist behavior uh, for you know, 20 or 30 years of their career, it, we've kind of reached a, a bulk where people can say, hey, we're not going to do this this way anymore. And they're going to be kind of the, the backup for the women who have, you know, been alone in the Senate and only had one bathroom and not had the support they needed. Yep. So I, I really think that when you get enough different kinds of people in a House or Senate, then the, the procedures are going to change whether you want them to or not. It's, it's moving. Yeah, there you go. We're out of time on this one. This group is back in a few minutes with a look at how good government measures fared. Not being able to get to that information is um, was a was a huge huge black hole for us. We were tr we were trying every which way to actually be able to access that um, from asking for legislative emails, which are covered. Um, um, when, well, not considered in some areas, um, not public information, then we were also um, taking on lawsuits. Um, we had conversations with local legislators to ask if they would themselves reveal what they were um, giving those funds to. Albuquerque police have a familiar face in the chief's office. Harold Medina will lead the department after serving in an interim role. We'll have company though, as Mayor Tim Keller also appointed Sylvester Stanley to lead reform efforts, including overseeing the academy and internal affairs. And my of correspondent, Gwyneth Dolan, talked to the two men about the challenges of their jobs, what will be different, and how they'll try to work together to address Albuquerque's high-profile crime problem. Superintendent Stanley, at the press conference when they announced your hiring, you said the buck stops with you. But there are two of you. So how are you two going to work through tough issues of culture change and accountability? Well, ma'am, it's uh, communication. Uh, I mean, you know, it's all about the uh, department. We're all part of the same team, even though we have different functions. Uh, the buck stops on the top end, uh, but we both have individual responsibilities that we're accountable for. And, but at the end of the day, in order to reach that goal, uh, Chief Medina and I have to communicate, have to communicate with other people of his staff, uh, but it's all about the same team effort. And I think great communication goes a long ways. And um, it's only been the first week, but I have no complaints about the communication with all the DCs as well as the chief. Everybody has been more than helpful and given me a helping hand trying to hit the ground running. Chief Medina, the ACLU said it was disappointed with your uh, hiring, but because uh, you come right out of the culture that has promoted this systemic inability to hold officers accountable. Is that fair? No, it's not fair. Because I think if you look at what everybody asked for is they asked for a transformational leader. And if you look at the very definition of that, that means somebody who has changed and can never change back. So by that very definition, uh, I've been very open about the fact that the best experience for my career was leaving the Albuquerque Police Department in 2014, going to the tribal community of Laguna, learning what I did beyond what I could have ever learned at a police department uh, because I had my hands so much uh, in the lowest levels of the department because it was smaller, but with the responsibility from the top that I had never experienced in Albuquerque and learning to work and understand culture and the conflicts between culture and law enforcement and how that creates friction is going to be the key to moving forward. And the one thing I do compliment the ACLU about saying is they didn't say that they had a personal issue with Harold Medina, the person. They had an issue with the fact that I had came up, come up through the system. And I'd be more than glad, and I look forward to the future 
when I could sit down and explain to them what my vision is and what I brought back from the Pueblo of Laguna and how it changed me. And through the very definition, I can't change back. Superintendent, you'll be in charge of, uh, you said, the police academy, the reform process with the Department of Justice, the disciplinary office uh, process for officers, and uh, Chief Medina will be in charge of kind of the day-to-day. -day. Aren't you literally being set up for a good cop, bad cop situation here? I don't think we're set up for that situation if we do, don't allow that to happen. Uh, we understand uh, where, where we're going uh, and the responsibilities. But I think it allows uh, Chief Medina, and uh, he's mentioned this several times, to where he can be out in the street and stay on top of the operational side of things, investigations and field services, and allow me to be that person that maintains the relationship with the Department of Justice and the training academy, as well as in internal affairs. Uh, that is a big load off of Chief Medina's plate. And I'm looking forward to that challenge and I'm confident that we'll be able to go in and make the necessary changes and update. But people also need to understand though, this is not gonna happen overnight. We didn't get here overnight and it's definitely not gonna happen overnight, uh, but we're gonna give it an honest effort. Well, it's been more than six years now uh, of the Department of Justice consent decree. And the most recent review from the monitor, James Ginger, was pretty bad. It was scathing. It led to an additional layer of outside oversight of the department. What is it going to take to make the changes in that consent decree once and for all? to make sure we're following the suggestions and the policies, the updates that need to be updated. Uh, as I indicated, this has been the first week and I'm, I'm getting uh, diving deeply involved in this thing. And so I think if you ask me that same question in about 30 days, I can give you more of a definitive answer. Uh, I'm visiting all of my respective responsibilities in term affairs unit and meeting with the commanders training and we need to sit down and do some more dissecting of those departments uh meeting with the commanders and talking to individual officers as well as the report that came back from the justice department so we can go in and see the places we need to make those necessary changes mm -hmm. chief medina you know folks have pointed out that you've been involved in at least two high profile shootings uh, as well as the scandal at the Laguna Pueblo Detention Center where a corrections officer was accused of raping an inmate on your watch. How do those experiences change your thoughts about the need to reform APD and how to go about it? You know, uh, honestly, uh, the Pueblo of Laguna incident uh, shows me how an individual could take a set of circumstances and, and uh, use it to their benefit. The Pueblo of Laguna, there were several uh, versions of the complaint that was actually filed. The first version didn't name me as being responsible for anything. Uh, it actually named the previous warden. Uh, I can't get into much detail because uh, that lawsuit uh, was settled uh, that included the Department of Interior, the Pueblo of Laguna, and others, and there, the file was sealed and nobody can discuss it, but there's a lot more uh, to that case than, than meets the eye. But I will say this, that's not related to the lawsuit, that facility had passed all of its inspections by the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, and had met all its requirements in its yearly assessments, and no issues were identified within that system. Uh, the warden had recently just been terminated and uh, I was only in acting capacity while they found a new warden. Uh, so in terms of the other incidents, I think those other incidents are great in terms of me being able to make differences and see what needs to occur with the Albuquerque Police Department. And it goes in several levels of, uh, of why 
it's I'm helpful to be uh, to have seen the culture and, and the training and the tactics that we used and how it needs to advance. Uh, first of all, uh, my officer involved shooting uh, was nearly 20 years ago. And I see how tactics over the next even 10 years changed. Uh, and I and you see how there's uh, tactics have gotten better. When my first officer involved shooting that I was involved in, uh, we didn't think of utilizing CIT. It wasn't a priority. There was no such thing as de-escalation. And having those things today, I look back how those things could have been uh, a whole different outcome could have occurred. Even uh, the Kenneth Ellis shooting, uh, I was on scene. And uh, at the time, supervisors were uh, very active uh, and involved in scenes. I had arrived for a certain function, but the DOJ process years later brought us other key aspects that could have helped us there that I recognize, uh, such as uh, de-escalation. Could you imagine had we had people trained in de-escalation for that shooting, but it was pre-DOJ. Could you imagine if we would have had ECIT officers at that time and been mandated to dispatch them? So I, it helps me really understand the past from where we weren't a great agency and we had mistakes to now the importance of having those things in this environment uh, so we could have more peaceful and better resolution. Well, let me ask you this. The monitor says we've made improvements in terms of training and policy changes. Um, you know, but 20 years after that, that first situation, we are still stuck on implementing those, that training and change in the department and changing the culture in the department. So how are you going to do that? You know, and I think that comes down to ensuring that from the top, it's viewed what is important. And I think that we have to look at the past, not just in terms of where we failed that DOJ has identified and that's part of the settlement agreement and we're being graded on, but we also have to change the past in the other areas that we struggled and make sure that all areas are moving forward. And one of the programs that I've started is our ambassador program. And this goes back to me even reaching out to members from the black community after uh, the riots when I took over in the fall. And that has become a very successful relationship. It's not, well, it's not a meeting anymore, it's a relationship. We're working projects together. So we have to move forward in ensuring that everybody in Albuquerque knows that we want to work together and we want to create trust. That's going to reduce friction. And when friction is reduced, the aspects that are involved with community engagement and our officers functioning in the community are going to improve, which is going to lead to more positive police interactions, which is going to help us start meeting the confines of the settlement agreement. As for culture change, we have to start rewarding the proper behavior. In 2018, I worked with CNM to start a process outside of <clears throat> militaristic style training of our academy. And now we have an educational based process that we're working with CNM which is very different. And there's a lot of officers who criticize it and do not like that process. But I feel that is the way, I know that is the way that we move forward in changing culture. We cannot train soldiers. We need to train community, uh, community guardians. And the other thing is recognizing and rewarding the correct behavior. So uh, what are your biggest challenges in getting to where you want to go, Chief? You know, the biggest challenge to start off with was time. There's only so much time I have in a day. Uh, when the mayor presented this concept to me, I accepted and supported it immediately because I saw that it would carve out time for me to be a typical police chief and what typical chiefs do across this nation that are successful, and that is focus on the operations of the department and making the community safe. My biggest challenge is I need to bring together the criminal justice system, as I stated earlier. This effect of having to arrest individuals over and over reaches into all parts of where we're struggling in a, as a department. We have high crime rates, which make more calls for service, 
Officers don't have dedicated time to go have community engagement, build relationships. Rearresting violent individuals over and over again increase the likelihood of force being used. And I personally have seen cases that have come through where our officers have used force on an individual up to three, four times because they keep getting released uh, from custody. Uh, so we have to work with the criminal justice system to make sure that when we do release people, we release them successful and with the resources needed so that they don't reoffend. And in that, I mean, we are releasing a lot of individuals with substance abuse problems and they still have that substance abuse problem and they're gonna continue the lifestyle and the trend which is committing crimes, which are gonna to lead to these problems. I think one huge solution is we all work together and we ensure that when we release somebody pending their, their trial dates, that we make sure they're giving every single resource and are monitored to ensure that they're getting the substance abuse counseling that they need to, to stay out of uh, trouble and not to have interactions with law enforcement. Superintendent Stanley, what made you want to take this job and what is it that you most want to achieve in it? Well, I, I thought it was exciting. Uh, it's here in my backyard. I don't have to move again. Uh, but I think it's challenging if I can leave part of a legacy as an impact on making change and being successful with the Albuquerque Police Department here. Uh, I think it goes a long ways. I, uh, I think I still have a lot to give in the law enforcement arena. And I think this, this was a great move to see all the things that we've had over the years and the things that we, I can help improve on. And I would love to be able to contribute. So one day I can tell my grandchildren, you know, I helped to make that change for the Albuquerque Police Department. Uh, the men and women that used to work for me in different agencies uh, has not, had did nothing but call and praise and congratulate me on knowing that I am the person that can help make that change because I'm a team player. I believe in being positive. I believe in the professionalism and the integrity of all the men and women, and that is my style. So I, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the challenge. Um, as the media have asked and inquired how we're going to do this, you know, I, I, I commend the mayor and his staff for thinking outside of the box and creating this superintendent position and allowing the chief to do those operational things. Uh, so I think we're going to set a, a be, become a role model for other departments. Uh, Albuquerque is going to be on the map and other large departments are going to say, hey, you know what? We need to take a page out of their book. So we need to be able to be on the front burner so we can set that tempo for other law enforcement officers. Thank you both very much for talking with me today about this. Thank you. You have a good day. As part of our Your New Mexico Government Project with media partners at KUNM and the Santa Fe Reporter, we're always interested in policy that affects how you interact with the women and men who represent you. There were a handful of so-called good government bills this session that met different fates. Key among those that passed was a bill that would open up the capital outlay process to see which projects lawmakers supported with their public funds. And Jessica Onsura, how, how might knowing what senators and representatives are prioritizing help both the media and the public? Well, these are taxpayer dollars that we're talking about. Let's just start there, right? The public has a right to know how they're being spent, where they're being spent, and how how our legislators are prioritizing um, dispersal of those funds. That's probably the primary po point in this entire debate. Um, the The way that the system is set up before is we wouldn't have uh, we wouldn't have access um, to that knowledge. They could say we're going to send funds to such and such organization, such and such. Um, area, but there would be no explicit um, reveal to the public of where that was going. Um, as journalists, we're always looking for transparency. I think that is a key to keeping our democracy safe and progressive and ongoing. Um, not being able to get to that information is um, was a was a 
huge, huge black hole for us. We were tr- we were trying every which way to actually be able to access that um, from asking for legislative emails, which are covered, um, um, well, not considered in some areas, um, not public information. Then we were also um, taking on lawsuits. Um, we had conversations with local ju- legislators to ask if they would themselves reveal what they were um, giving those funds to. In many cases, some did. Um, and I think that I want to give big kudos to our rural legislators who um, voluntarily um, last year gave gave their list of capital outlay fundings um, out to the public. So I think um, if we're coming back to this this topic, it's really about the need to know where our tax dollars are going. Andy, um, you know, look, the third, a third, a third thing that we've been under here for capital outlay since forever seems so cumbersome and so inefficient. And everyone seems to know it, but we didn't know how to take that next step to get there. What, what was the sense of the, of the debate in this time around? Um, I think it might be just about that time. Uh, I think somebody mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know, this um, sort of takes years to get things done. And mm-hmm. I think uh, we're just now getting out of this culture of, you know, people do things secretly and this is the way it's always been done. So why buck that trend? And um, yeah, I do think, uh, back to Jessica's point, kudos goes to those rural lawmakers who are saying, yes, this is the money I'm pulling for. We have just so much history of uh, lawmakers sort of trying to do favors for their their friends and their districts, and we just, you know, didn't connect the dots. And so I think we're, we're sort of coming out of that now. Yeah. Dan, it's kind of the same question, essentially, but... You know, to you, does seeing behind the curtain encourage better uh, capital outlay planning and more accountability? I mean, you know, operative word there, encourage, (laughs) not guarantee, encourage. You know, how far can we get down the road with what we have on our hands now? Yeah, we'll see. I, I think this is a, a positive step, uh, that kind of disclosure, and, but it's it's not an overhaul of the capital outlay system. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the process is still going to work the same way. Uh, there's been a lot of concern about inefficiency and a lot of money sitting there that gets allocated and then isn't spent. Um, so th- this might put a little more of an onus on, on legislators now that we can all see which projects they're funding, you know, that, hey, if all these projects you funded didn't move forward, maybe you need to coordinate a little bit better with local governments or things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was interesting to me to see after, after debating this issue for a few years and this year, the bill, you know, sailed through. I, I, I don't know, even know if it got maybe one or two dissenting votes, but I think clearly their legislators felt pressure to, to at least kind of take this step and, and we'll kind of see how that works and, and if additional changes need to be made. Yeah. Inez, you know, the legislature also passed a redistricting commission bill. It'll require consultation with tribes and prohibit considering political makeup or of districts, among other things, but it will allow lawmakers to draw their own maps instead of picking from a handful of commission sets forward. Is this really meaningful reform? Yes, I believe it is because um, it's the first time that someone outside the legislature draws the maps to begin with. So they're going to have a palette to start with. And I do think that embarrassment and shaming uh, can work. So if, for example, the legislature rejected all the maps and, and did horrible gerrymandering, they would A, get sued, which no one wants to see, and B, everyone in the state who is in favor of good government, and that's you know up and down from newspapers to groups to individuals, would embarrass them. I mean, Speaker Egoff was against this bill until I think he got a lot of pushback and he found a compromise, which included the legislature being able to have a say. And I think that compromise is important also because that's sort of in the constitution. So the compromise they ended up with get citizen involvement is independent, involves communities throughout the state, is transparent, and it keeps legislative consul- consultation at the end, which you could argue is in the Constitution. So it's not going to be sued if the governor does sign it. Mm-hmm. That's, I, I appreciate you bringing that point up, too, about the constitutionality. I, it's not often talked about. Uh, Jessica, on, the, on a similar note, we also didn't see measures to pass professionalizing the citizen legislature or to require more disclosure from lobbyists. Why is ethics and transparency so hard for us? What, what's going on here? I think it's just, again, to that, um, what we've been discussing before is that longstanding um, tradition and culture of, of these two bodies. Um, transparency is, 
um, is hard. It's hard work. You really have to have systems in place. Um, you have to look at it as, as something that's fair across and, and easy to execute because um, we're talking about, you know, a lot of a lot of information here. Um, the question that you ask, you know, why is it so hard for us? Um, there's a lot of pushback as well. There are some um, uh, bodies, people out there who would like to keep some of these things, as you said, behind the curtain. It's just um easier for them. Um, but also I think that one of the things to note in this conversation is how much more we're talking about transparency and access, um, not only for journalists like us, but for the public themselves who are interested in finding out more about how these, um, how their local and state government work. Mm -hmm. Annie Lyman from the Mexico Political Report. Um, interesting, open primaries failed, um, all, as did holding primaries for special elections like the CD1 race we have coming up for Deb Holland's seat. Do we have an effective primary system now or does it too heavily favor insiders as it stands? As, as far as the, uh, the special election goes, <clears throat> excuse me, it's, it's one of those things that really only comes up in, a, in, you know, I don't think anybody ever thought about looking at that law until of course it, now it comes up that, you know, how often does this situation happen? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's kind of split. I think that there's some, some folks that, uh, would rather it stay the way it is because you've got candidates who are just independently wealthy, right? right? They can come out of the gate and they can sell themselves to the central committee as the person with the most money, the easiest, you know, the, the fastest fundraiser, mm -hmm. um, you know, on the other hand, sort of in, in generally speaking, yeah, I think a lot of people are, are saying, you know, we don't even get to pick this person. Right. So now, uh, you know, and it goes back to the open primary thing, which by the way, I think, is another one of those things that's going to take a few more years to, to work out. It's just sort of the, the slow burn so to speak. Dan Boyd, last, uh, last word for you on that, on that same subject. We got about just about 30 seconds here. Yeah. Just a couple of quick ones I was going to mention was, you know, the state did recently create a new ethics commission also passed some more disclosure rules for uh, independent expenditures. So I, I think sometimes uh, th there's a sentiment that we took these big steps. Let's give it a few years, see how they work. And if we need to come back, make some tweaks, but uh, this is an ongoing conversation and certainly, you know, we haven't seen the last of it. There you go. We're out of time. Thanks to each of, you, each of you for your thoughts today and for your work during this session. <clears throat> now that the session is in the rearview mirror, if you're not counting cannabis, how should we consider the results? As you heard from the panelists, while some things passed, many, many impactful pieces of legislation were never considered, let alone heard, which is why watching our elected folks celebrate this session with a touchdown dance left many of us grinding our teeth in silent frustration again. Perhaps it's now time to finally have that serious conversation of some sort of time extension for sessions. My number is four to six months, if full time is too big a bite to swallow currently. You might recall a bill to have our even year sessions go to 45 days. That's not a fix to me, but it is an effort. Which brings me back to adult use recreational cannabis and the need for a special session. All right, watching exhausted, annoyed legislators trying to work something so complex, so impactful, at some point has to be viewed as an unacceptable way to make important legislation. We deserve better. We deserve lawmakers who can make law without a ticking clock. We deserve a legislature that is opportunistic, agile, and responsive. That's not gonna happen in 60 or 90 days, and at some point, we have to let these folks know the way we do it now is out of step with the world, and that's unacceptable. Thanks again for joining us and for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.